Cool. Um, I'm not going to bore you guys with this, this this presentation that I do. I try to condense it. I do it. It usually goes for like five, six hours. Um, but there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot to sales. I think as founders, you guys will realize um, one of the things that is often overlooked by a lot of companies, and I see it with a lot of, especially in tech, is that we try to go and like over engineer on a product and we don't worry about how to build a sound business on actually selling it. Um, and so yeah, my story is I'm a sales guy, guys. I'm, I might be a tech CEO now, but um, my whole career, even from when I was a little kid, like at eight years old, um, my dad was in real estate. He would leave me at a house and he'd have another house down the street and I would go, hey, um, I would go and uh, now, I would go and start showing the house around, like when somebody came to see it, you know, and I'd be like, hey, this is a two and a half bath over here, and blah, blah, blah. And at eight years old, this couple started crying, and they were like, are we about to buy a house with this kid? <laughs> like, I just like did that. And like, so, like, and my dad, ever since then, he's like, you all, you know, you, you got it. But I think one of the key things, you know, in, this, in, in my story, um, it was, it, it's, I just, I'm just a grinder. I mean, there's, there's nobody who. I've met yet that could try to outwork me. If it comes to outworking me, you're gonna you're gonna fail because I'll, I'll just go that extra mile every single time. And, um, and so yeah, it, it comes down to grit. But I uh, I started my sales career. Um, I mean, I was in mobile like right away, right out of high school. I was uh, working for a company called Keating Technologies. They represented U.S. microcomputer companies here in Canada, and they worked with U.S. robotics. And I got to mess around with the Palm Pilot 1000 back in the 90s and I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And you know, so I started messing around with it, but I was in logistics, I was packing boxes, I graduated half a semester early before I went to university um, doing my OECs and I was just packing boxes, but what I started doing was my hustle was always in me and I was always bothering the president, like, what are you working on? Like, what else can I do? He's like, don't you got to put boxes to pack? I'm like, I did them all. Like, I need something more strategic to do, I can't be packing boxes all the time. Um, but sure enough, I mean, fast forward, you know, I went through the tech bubble. Um, I started because obviously, you know, I became more strategic than just being the logistics guy um, and helping them sign on much more U.S. computer companies here. And that was my first like forte into real B two B business development. Um, and then when the tech bubble burst, um, you kind of fall flat on your face. You know, as a young kid, I thought I made it. I was like, everybody's an idiot. I was doing some side hustle and all that stupid stuff. I should have been arrested for it, truthfully. Um, where I was making a lot of money and I thought I had the whole world figured out, right? And then sure enough, boom, reality hits you and you're like, you're nobody, you're like fucking out of school now and you're sitting at home and and doing nothing, growing a beard and like literally in depression. Like, you know, I, I could be open about it. It was like the lowest point in my, in my life. I lost, a, I lost a guy who was like an older brother to me. He passed away around that time. Like it was the worst part of my life. And... You know, I had a conversation with my dad, and it was probably six months into me being in this, like, really bad rut. And he was just like, just get up and go, you know, go, just get up and start going out again. Just be yourself. Like, you just, this is not you. Just rotting here, rotting, rotting away here at home. And it was a pinnacle moment because I went, and I got up, and I went back into, like, all the connections I made throughout the, the throughout my past couple careers. And, you know, everybody kept saying to me, look, dude, you're, you're, like, sales is your thing. I just didn't know how to get into sales. I was like, yeah, I don't know if it's my thing or not. They were like, I'm going to make an introduction for you. You're going to go and sell photocopiers. And that's going to become your MBA in sales. And so I went. I highly encourage this for all the founders over here. Hire photocopier reps. They're so well trained. Because what happens is if you could sell a box that prints paper better than the next person who sells a box that prints paper, then you're truly a good salesperson. Um, and so I started working for Rico Canada. Uh, I made... $24,000 a year was my base salary, and the rest was like, go and earn your commission. Um, I went through former, formal sales training. I'll teach you some of the stuff that I've actually gone through, and um, I highly recommend some of the, the training that I've done. Um, but, I, you know, they gave me a territory. My first territory was Yorkville, and they go, go out to Yorkville. Um, you know, this is going to be your territory, and go out there and, like, literally go door to door and convince people to buy photocopiers off you. Um, and so I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I got downtown Yorkville. This is going to be pretty cool. And everyone, like, my manager's like, don't worry. I'll move your territory after. Don't worry. Don't worry. Just go in there now and start learning and I'll move your territory. I'm like, why would you want me to move my territory? So I come out at Young and Bloor on my like, first day going to like pound the pavement. And I come out and I'm like, that's the building I want to hit. And my buddy Dan is like, I'm going to come with you and like, I'll buddy with you and we'll get this done. And that's a good lesson too because... You know, you have somebody motivating you when you're doing something challenging, it works. So, like, we were buddying up. 
And I look up and I go, oh, fuck. And the building had Xerox written on the top of it. <laughs> and I'm selling Rico. Now, nine out of 10 people would turn around and be like, all right, like, I'm going to go somewhere else or whatever, which is obviously what was happening in that territory before I got the job. Not me. I walked into that off. I walked into that building. I went to the elevator. I hit the top floor, and boom! I started cold calling in Xerox's head office building. And sure enough, I made President's Club that year. I crushed every number that they gave, they gave me. I walked away with close close to about a hundred grand that first year, which was pretty killer um, for being like a small business copier sales rep. Um, but I got a lot of formal training. I mean, it's hard to go door to door to door to door and like get told to literally go fuck yourself every, every hour at least, um, and then have the tenacity and grit to just go again and go do it. And that's, and that's, you know, that's, that's kind of like where my sales career really, and like, you'll see as I, as I talk to you guys, where my bluntness and brashness comes from, because I got told to go F myself over and over and over again, but it doesn't stop me from hitting my number, and it doesn't stop me from hitting the goals and the targets that were out there. And when I heard excuses from other people on the sale, on like on my sales team or, Around me, when you're in a sales pit of literally like 45 guys, it's kind of like the movie Broiler Room. If you guys ever watched Broiler Room, um, where they're you know, it's like the survival of the fittest, you're gonna get killed if you're not like you don't become that brash person. Um, but it, it made me realize like if you apply yourself, you can think big. Uh, fast forward a bit, I did a whole bunch of stuff. I started selling data science, um, back in 2004 or five. People thought I was a witch doctor. Um, you know, back in 2005, you know, nobody's ever heard of it. I did that for a while. I ran, a, I ran sales for Millward Brown, which is a, a WPP company here in the advertising world. Um, so I ran that for Canada. Um, and then sure enough, I hit um, Extreme Labs, and I started working at Extreme Labs, and we were building mobile apps before mobile was mobile. I mean, there was no iPhone now. And so I started working at uh, Extreme Labs. I knew the guys who founded Extreme Labs, and I was, I was consulting for them, and like, Helping them get just kind of like talking to you guys, where I was helping them get leads and how to how to build a sales funnel and like helping them get off the ground. And eventually, I realized I was spending more time there than I was actually at my real day job. And so I started working at Extreme. Um, the first thing we did was we verticalized and said like the iPhone came out obviously, and like a, it, there was this hockey stick of growth happening there. Um, but I started working there when there was like about third people. Um, and what ended up happening was at Extreme that. The, the cool thing was that I was like, the first thing we got to do is like verticalize our teams. Let's go be thought leaders of, of what we're going to go do. Um, so we did that, and I ended up running the media vertical. The, I let the people who were there before me take whatever they wanted. I was like, I, don't, I could get passionate about anything. I don't care. Um, hindsight, it's different now. <laughs> um, I, you know, I would have, I, I should have picked probably what I was most passionate about. But I mean, I, feel, I had made the media vertical fall in my lap. So all I did was like live, breathe media day and night, um, and. Out of extreme, when we got acquired, we did just over thirty, just about thirty-six million in revenue that year. Twenty-five and a half came from this guy, so I did way more than all the other teams combined. Um, and and then that's not by fluke. Like everywhere I went, that's not by fluke. It kept happening. So I'm going to try to teach you guys the actual mechanics of what it takes to be the right salesperson. And if some of you, like as 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 of right now, you know, founders are always the best salespeople in the beginning. Um, but I'll also try to educate you on like what you what you need to expect from the sales team and how you should actually structure a team so that they can go and be more effective. I tell people at Tribal Skill all the time and Laura's lucky and that she sits there and she hears me saying this all the time. I'm like, I wrote a fucking playbook for you. If you can't follow the 15 steps I gave you, then you suck. Like it's it's like literally just follow these 15 steps and you will you will you will you will you will sell. So I'll walk you through how we how we how, how I do that. Any questions? I feel like I'm talking all the time. You guys can stop me at any point. You get commission on the houses? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? That was in the late '80s. I, that, that's another crash, right? Like my dad got caught with his pants down when uh, when that market crashed back then too. So I've seen ups and downs all the way through my life. I'm on a good up right now. I don't want to ever go back. That's my motivation, though. I mean, I, I tell that depressing story because as founders, you're going to go through hell all the time. And I always look back at that moment in my life, say, how can I get as far away from that moment as possible? Like, what am I going to do today to get even further away from that point in my life? Um, yeah, so Tribal Skill, have you guys heard of us before? We've been around for 18 months now. We just crossed uh, 100 people. Mark, uh, my trailing 12 months of revenue is over 10 and a half million. Um, we work with some of 
the most, what I like to consider, companies that want to be the most innovative in the digital space. Um, but what we did is we built a brand. What you guys got to do is start building a brand for your company. And so how do you go and do that? And that's the word. You just kind of hustle. Every day you got to get up and be like, what am I going to do? What are the five things I'm going to do to actually make my brand be relevant to my consumers? Right? Figure out who your customers are and you're going to have to go and figure out how you're going to be relevant. That may be on Sunday nights, I set up my, I use Buffer and I set up my Twitter feed and I go through all the articles that are important to me and I, have, I make a comment about them and I put them out there. Almost weekly I write a blog, I speak all over the place. I do everything I can to make sure the tribal skill name gets out there and people understand what we actually stand for as a brand. Um, and so it's, it's non-stop hustle of actually going out and, and doing that. Um, don't be afraid. It's like the, the Xerox analogy, right? Like I wasn't afraid to go in that room. I don't be afraid to go push the envelope um, when it comes to tribal skill and, and where we actually take it. Let's actually build a brand that means something so that people want to associate themselves with it. This is the best. So <laughs> Laura knows this and Sean knows this. So I'm doing a conference and I'm setting up a conference where I'm going to bring people, you know, our current customers and I'm going to bring people like some of the best speakers from all over the world, um, as you know, as far away as India and Dubai, actually, um, here to Toronto to actually do a conference. And why am I going to do that? Because I look at this and I go, if someone, if my, what is my competitor doing that right, right now? that would actually come and intimidate me. That's how that idea came up. I was like, if my competitor went and threw a conference with all my customers going to it, I'd kind of be shaking in my boots that, whoa, shit, why am I do that? And so what did I do? I pivoted and was like, here's what I'm gonna do to make them all fucking be scared, right? And so now I'm doing a conference here and you know all of my competitors are shaking right now going, oh shit. He's literally gonna have all of our customers in a room with people on stage talking about how awesome he is, right? And so I take this philosophy of Mark Cuban to heart in every step I do. There, you'll find me working on Sundays. Why not? Not only because I like to hustle, it's because I know my competitors are sleeping at home or they're taking care of their kids and I don't got any kids, so I can go to the office on Sunday and I'm going to take another two steps closer to making sure I kick their ass. And I do that over and over and over. And that, it's that competitive nature. And I do this, and I follow this, and I make our leadership team think of this all the time. What are you doing today that's going to be super impactful? That's going to drive revenue uh, as the bottom line. At the end of the day, guys, we love working together. It's fun, all this, all that. Nothing fucking matters except for the revenue. Like, nothing else matters. What are you going to do to drive revenue? If I do a bunch of community stuff, I do a founder's breakfast, I do a CTO breakfast, I do all this stuff to give back to the Toronto community, at the end of the day, I, it, obviously, there's a lot of benefits to obviously doing all that stuff. It's not necessarily a tangible business development, but I'm like, hey, we got to put Toronto on the map because the high tide's going to rise all boats. It's going to drive fucking revenue. And if I don't do it, I hope that I start doing it, others look at me and say, hey, what he's doing is right, we should start doing it, and we can actually start building something in Toronto that's going to actually create revenue for all of us, right? That's something the Valley has such a dense population in tech gets and they start doing, they, they do really well. Um, and so nonstop, I take this mantra on almost everything we do. Every, everybody in the leadership team is like, what are you going to do? Who's out there coming to kill us? And what are they going to do to come kill us? A, what's your defense mechanism? And B, if we were going to go kill someone else, what's, what are we going to do? It's that real hunter mentality. Um, <laughs> this comes out. This comes out wrong all the time. I'm gonna say. It, I'm gonna say. It, I'm gonna say it in a way. Um, anybody know what happened in 1954? Probably many things. Something. Something. Yeah, something pretty big happened. Roger <laughs> Bannister. Everybody thought mankind could not run a four-minute mile, and this guy fucking in 1954 ran a four-minute mile. What happened that year? The year after he did it? Someone ran Four others ran a four minute mile. And so it literally comes down, and I, I might sound obnoxious and you might call me a prick or whatever, but it really comes down to having, you know, I think a good Jewish term is like the hood spot. Having, having, you know, your, your, having the confidence in yourself, knowing that you could go and do it. 
Um, and, that's, and that articulates the reason why companies come and work with us at Tribal Scale. I started the company off a of fucking deck and walked into Disney and was like, here's why you're going to work with me. Here's what we're going to do for you, this and that, blah, 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 blah. But I had all the confidence in the world that I knew I was going to create a win-win situation for them that they signed. My first client was Disney. And they signed the deal off us on the deck. They actually made me close the computer and were like, your confidence on what you're saying to us all makes sense and we're going to come and work for you. Um, another thing about confidence is your customers smell weakness right away. And they'll know that you're being they'll, know, they'll They'll associate your weakness and your lack of confidence with your product being shit. And you can't have that. Like you have to have this guard of being like, here's why we're awesome. Here's what we're going to do for you. Here's how we're going to create a win-win situation. There's no reason we shouldn't work together. And you got to be blunt and confident by doing that. Um, one of the tricks I use when, when it comes to not being able to... Sales is not about rambling on. It's about being very effective in what you communicate and what's important to that person. So one of the tricks that I use, I use, is, I use the rule of three. I always... In, you know, you've heard me talk, and I always say this. I'm like, there's three things you know, are going to be super important to your job. Here's what you need to know. Boom, boom, boom. And like, I talk and I use the word, the word of three doing that. And the reason I, I, I do it that way is because it helps structure you in your mind on what are they going to be the three important things that are going to be important to your customer. Um, we'll get into a little bit more, but like, make sure you guys got a lot of confidence in what you're doing. And if you don't got confidence in a certain area, it's okay to tell the client, I'm not there yet, but here's what I'm going to do to make sure I cover that up. Or our product can't be used that way. That's not what it's built for. This is not the use case. That's fine too. But be confident in whatever you're saying and make sure you stand behind what you're selling. So talented people, I mean, we could talk to this. I think I'll, I'll skip this for now because we'll go into how we, we started building our like culture and at tribal skill, but I think let's get let's get more into more of the tactical sales stuff. And everything's gonna come down to process when it comes to when it comes to um, sales. I was working at Pivotal, I was making fuck, too much money for what I was doing. I was making like four hundred grand a year, um, barely showing up to the office. I was traveling the world partying my ass off. Uh, and <laughs> you know, most people would be like, You're crazy, why would you do that? You had all this stock. You would have become a millionaire when the thing IPOs. Um, but why, why would you leave? And I was like, because I realized that me not going in the office for three months made me irrelevant. And what, what ended up happening is I built up, I spent my whole career building up this amazing network. And in your network, it's like the change that you keep putting back into it. You don't, you don't go and do, I don't come here to DMZ to help Shane in the hopes that, oh, I'm gonna get business from this group right here. That's not why I'm here. I'm putting my, my, my chains like in a piggy bank into my network with Shane and Islam and everybody here at the DMZ and all of you guys, knowing that, hey, you know what? One day, something may happen where it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be an opportunity for us to work together and do something together. And so look at your network that way. Too often people think, you know, I do this, this, this most sales guys say this and it drives me nuts. It's like, oh, we went out to that dinner. That guy's never gonna do work for work with us. He's useless. I'm like, you're an idiot. Like, that person came out to your dinner, that person came out to your dinner, sat there, ate with you guys, listened to all your stories about your work. If they're not working with you now, that's okay, but in the future they are. And the reason I left Pivotal is because I built this amazing network and I realized I was just gonna dwindle, dwindle away and become this irrelevant person um, in the tech scene, which is not my personality. So I quit and started Tribal Scale. Um, but your network is your net worth, and like, make sure you nurture it. Like, do. Put 10 times more into your network than you get back. Um, there's a fine art of saying no that we were talking about earlier, but people will appreciate that when you actually say no and say, I can't do this for you right now. Here's why, right? Um, instead of stringing them along. But really nurture your networks. They're going to be the ones who are going to actually develop, um, de develop your path for you. The other thing I really want to talk about is community and inserting yourself in the community. Um, Community is huge. We do a bunch of stuff. We do not only the founders breakfast, we do the CTO breakfast. I sponsor FITC. I do every, everything. Whatever comes across my desk, I'm like, okay, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do this, we'll do that. And I do that because I want to build a community around what we're actually doing. A lot of cool things start happening when you start doing this. 
not only do you insert yourself in the community that you build your amazing network around in that community, but people look to you as your subject matter expert. Right? The other thing about community is find out who the like-minded players are in your, in your area. You should go sit with the guys from Remind, right? And talk to them. I go and sit with all the people whose ass I want to kick and have coffee or lunch with them all the time. I call us friends. Sure, let's go talk. You're having the same challenges I'm having. And we build this sense of community because what's going to happen is you can get so much learning there. Um, that'll, that'll propel your company. Another cool thing. Pumping into your community and your network, find the companies that actually fit within your stack. So we do software development. Amazon fits really nicely into my stack as a platform for a voice. Google or Apple sit in for iOS or Android. There's a million other players when it comes to building something in mobile. There's push notification providers. There's video service providers. There's all, there's all this stuff out there. I play nice with all of these other people and say, I want to understand what your business does. And if there's a benefit to my client, I'm going to take it to them. That does two things. The cool thing about building that community is who's the trusted leader that ABC News calls when they want anything done in the mobile app? Me. Why? Because I understand what's happening in the community, what services are out there. I could give them a non-biased opinion. I don't give a shit who gets the deal. I'll just tell you what's best for you. So that's really important. The second thing that's really important about doing that is now I'm becoming deal flow for all these other guys. And like, I, like the other slide showed you in the piggy bank, when you start doing that with enough people, that's who starts tossing you opportunities over and over and over again, right? People in your network are going to start, in your community, are going to start being like, hey, you know what, let's help this person out, or they have a good solution for them. So it's really important that you start figuring out what your role is in, that, in, in, in the community that you're in. Communication, share your story. I think we, you guys, like, if you can't tell me what you do within 30 seconds, you're fucking up already, like pretty bad. You gotta like within 30 seconds be able to effectively communicate what if your company does and why people want, why people should use you. Like that's all you got. And so you'd be, I'm, I'm surprised at how many founders don't take the actual time to, to figure that out, right? Be able to get up there and say, here's what we do. I'll give you an example. We can say, I can say we're tribal scale. We build web, mobile, and emerging technology software. People use us because of our agile methodology and because of our reputation. They know that we've been there and done that. We're not going to let them down. Everybody know what I did? It's pretty simple, right? Like, so you have to have it very clear and easy um, to communicate what you do. It's never good to overcomplicate your story. Uh, I even look at our website right now, and I'm like, it's looking too complicated. There's too much there. Let me just keep it more simple and keep it clear. If you can't explain it to my, my golden rules, if I can't explain it to my mom, my, the old Indian lady, then it's not, it's, it's no good. Um, so, yeah, communication is, is definitely key. Great partners, we kind of just talked about. 80-20 rule. This is words to live by. Anybody know what that is? Everybody I'm assuming knows. So, in sales, it's, it's never more true. 80% of your business is going to come from the top 20% of your clients. So why the fuck do reps? Spend all their time chasing these stupid accounts and not going after that 20%. Um, one of the things I find that most reps do um, is don't think big and they get really hopped up on their little wins. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was a, I met a really, I won't say who the company was, but I met a really cool entrepreneur who's you know, building their business here in Toronto and was so happy that they got a deal with Cal McLeod. I was like, that's cool. You got a cool like, Canadian startup as, as, as part of your roster. How much money are you going to make off them? Oh, they're not really in my profitable thing, but they're a great logo grab. I'm like, well, who's in your profitable, rep like, who's, who are your profitable customers? And he goes and names, like, five huge software conglomerates. I'm like, you got three of those? Like, you got Microsoft? Why the fuck are you chasing Thal McLeod? Why would you even bother wasting your fucking time doing that? Go after every large computer software company that's using your goddamn service. Because you got Microsoft, you could get IBM, you could go get Oracle. Why are you going after Thalmic Labs and chasing these guys for fucking six months? It's so stupid. And everybody does it over and over again. Now, I see every, like the biggest mistake sales reps are doing is they're just like, oh, I found an opportunity, so I should chase it. And that's just chasing a dollar. That's not being strategic. You, what you should really do is know... Here's the 20 accounts that I'm going to go sell to, and here's how I'm going to go out there and go get them. 
Here it's, this is, these are the 20 accounts that I need to actually go after. And 20 is the magic number because depending how complex your sales cycle is, especially in our business, 20 accounts should keep you busy all year long. Like you should be just working those 20 accounts all year long. So it's okay to, you know, if it's a quick transactional deal that you're doing, if money comes in the door, then go ahead and do it. But I, I don't get why you would go like drive out to somewhere, spend all day trying to sell someone, go through this long sales cycle, and then them not be like in your top 20% of, of business, uh, of, 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 your, of, of the customer who's gonna actually drive your revenue, right? Like this, this rule is super, super important, and it's really important that quarterly you go and you assess, are you actually targeting on that 80-20? So quarterly, I, I ask my reps to actually go and say, which accounts are you taking out of your top 20 now? Which ones are you putting in that are gonna reflect your 80-20 even closer? And we'll just keep refining that over and over and over. And then they're just gonna get better and better and better at their top 20%. Their revenues just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so super important to follow this rule in sales. Uh, don't just chase the dollar, chase the strategic dollar. It's gonna be, your time's gonna be more, much more valuable to spend there. <laughs> All right, let's get into some real sales stuff. Anybody heard of spin selling? Yeah. Anybody taken, read, read the book? Yeah. yeah, awesome, awesome. So this is a quick little video. Um, and it's gonna give you a real quick refresher on spin selling. Um, we could, you know, I usually could, when, when I do this, I usually play a game and like start saying, all right, like, let me show you how you can actually use this in practice. Um, and so I'll give like, you guys could like toss, like, like who, it's kind of like whose line is there anyway, you guys could toss out scenarios at me and I'll do it like on the spot. And I love doing it because it's a good challenge and you'll keep learning. But there's a couple aspects of spin. There's situation questions, problem questions, implication questions, need payoff questions. And the strategy behind spin is that you're just going to ask your customers questions. And by asking them a series of questions, they themselves are going to tell you what the solution is. But you're guiding them down the path that the solution that they tell you is the one that you're going to actually go and sell them. So we could watch this video real quick and then do that exercise. We all know that sales is all about asking the right questions. But how do you know what questions to ask during a sales conversation? And when do you ask them? In the book Spin Selling, author Neil Rackham gives us a sales tool that will help you ask the perfect sales questions that builds rapport and credibility. Spin is used as an acronym of four different types of sales questions. These questions are situation questions, where you collect facts and background data, problem questions, where you identify the customer's dissatisfactions, implication questions, where you identify the negative consequences of the customer's problem, need payoff questions, where you identify the real benefits of the right solution. Let's look at these four question types in turn. Number one, situation questions. With situation questions, you collect facts and background data about the customer's existing situation. By asking situation type questions, you will get a great understanding of your client's context. Example questions are, how many customers do you have? How do you keep track of your sales pipeline? What type of software do you run? Watch out with situation questions. Do not ask too many of them. First of all, they will bore the prospect, and second, nowadays the prospect expects you to have done your research. So the key to succeeding with situation questions is to do research in advance of the conversation. Number two, problem questions. Problem questions are all about the customer's difficulties or dissatisfactions. If you can get a customer to acknowledge there is a problem that needs to be fixed, they are far more likely to give you the attention you need to close a deal. Problem questions achieve just that by discovering what is causing your prospect's pain. Examples of problem questions are How do you keep track of all your employees' billable hours? Do you currently ever run out of office supplies before, you next, before your next delivery? Do you use all features of your current software? Often a great next step after you find a problem is to follow up with a question that asks more detail about the problem. A great way to do this is to use questions asking where, when, who, how often, and what happens if when. And that way, you will get a real in-depth description 
of the problem and it will be easier to start your third question type, the implication questions, which is number three. Implication questions will make the customer explain the negative impact of the earlier defined problem. Of course, if you want your prospect to consider your solution in any seriousness, they need to have a firm grasp on how serious the problem is. Examples of implication questions. If leads don't get inputted onto your CRM system, what's the impact on your sales outlook? If training of your sales employees is costly and time consuming, what does that mean for new reps when they start? If you can't accurately see your marketing data, how do you know what works? Always make sure that you link your implication questions to other parts of the conversation. Also prepare some really good cases or stories that visualizes the negative consequences of the problem. In that way you communicate your expertise and the client will know you understand their worldview. Number four, need payoff questions. The final stage of spin selling, the need of, need payoff questions, is to let the prospect understand how valuable your solution is. The secret to getting results with need payoff questions is to ensure the prospect specifies the benefits themselves instead of you dictating the benefits to them. So please encourage your prospect to visualize and imagine what would be different when his problem is gone and let him explain this. The beauty of the need payoff questions is that if you get them right, your customer will tell you in exact detail how your product will help. In that way, they will convince themselves about the beauty of your solution which is exactly what we want. Examples of need payoff questions. Why is being able to have a big picture overview of your sales pipeline important to you? If you could cut the amount of time spent training new staff, what impact would that have? If you could see at a glance what your marketing results are, how would that help you in your marketing decisions? Need payoff questions need to evoke positive emotions. After all, it feels good to know that a problem that their problem can finally be solved. Also, always make sure that you ask need payoff questions before describing your solution. You want to do this so that the buyer is eager to listen to you about your solution. So, these are the four type of questions to ask during a sales conversation. Thank you for watching this video of Right Brain Book Academy and have a great day. So this is hard shit. It's not easy. Um, I still struggle at times, but I, you know, I, I practice it all the time. And the only way you can practice it is, is literally taking your customer um, and walking through and actually writing down what you think their situation is what the problem's gonna be, and having these questions before you even go into your meeting with them. Um, I highly recommend you read the book Spin Selling. There's a Spin Selling handbook also that makes you, walks you through exercises that you could actually do, run on your own company, and you can actually do the exercises with it. So get the Spin Selling book, the Spin Selling handbook, then practice Spin Selling for a while, and actually go out there and practice it in the market. And then I'm gonna tell you to stop, <laughs> and then go get another one after you've only practiced it probably for like six months. And then go get a book called The Challenger Sale. And that book's gonna teach you how to challenge you and, and it actually be the thought leader who actually pushes the envelope with your customers even more. Where you actually challenge them and show them that you're the expert and why they should do things your way, which is pretty cool also. But I wouldn't do that both techniques right away until you master this first. Um, couple red flags. Don't go into a client and not have your homework done. Like, have know what they have so that your situation questions are literally just set in the stage. Don't go and ask, ask 20 situation questions. Just ask like two or three, understand what they're doing, and then move into your problem questions and start figuring out what their actual problems are. Figure out what the implication, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? What's the implication of that problem, right? Like, what, what's actually going to happen to them? And then if, it, if there wasn't a better way, well, what could that be? Like, how are you going to solve it with your new payoff question? Only after you do all this do you present your solution. 
Don't go in and start talking about, well, I got the software and can let teachers talk to students and blah, 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 blah. You don't even know if that's their issue, right? You gotta set them up to actually set the stage as to why your solution is really important. So make sure you ask these questions up front and then you'll know what's important to that customer. Remember I said the rule of three? Then actually hammer home your three biggest benefits of what, uh, of what your solution can do for that person. Here's an easy way to always sell um, your solution. Whenever you, when it comes after you've done this and you want to go into, I don't know if I got a slide on it, but we can talk about it anyway. Um, the easiest way to sell your solution is remember this: features, advantage, benefit. With this, literally, you write say the words. With this, say the feature of your product. You can say the advantage of that of what, of what that feature actually does, which means, say the benefit. So you guys can try, try with me on anything. So I can try to sell you, and tell me something to sell. Sell you the phone. Sell you the phone. With this phone, you can now call your wife, which means she won't kick your ass when you get home. <laughs> right, like you could start practicing that. So you have, with this, you can, which means. Every conversation you guys have, there's a sale being made. Either your wife is going to tell you to go home, or you and I are going to go for beers. It's going to be your conversation with your wife, which is going to, either she's going to sell you that you need to get your ass home, or you're going to sell her that it's good to go for beers with me. Right? Every conversation you have is this made. And so learn some of these steps. I'm not saying mind fuck the people you love, but you can if you really wanted to. But learn these steps. And always remember, with this feature, you can advantage, which means benefit. And if you start phrasing yourself and communicating in that way, you'll see people start to gravitate towards what you're saying. They'll understand the benefit of why you may want to go for chicken tonight instead of pizza, right? Um, and that, and, 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 and that, that correlates in everyday life. Um, you guys should use that. But whenever you go, after you've done your spin questions, when you go to present your solution, remember the three features you want to do and use that format to actually get buy-in from your client, from the person you're selling. Cool? Um, how many of you guys have actually gone through and done something like this with the buyer's, buyer persona? You've actually gone through and like figured out what the different buyers are? So generally you'll find there'll be three or four different buyers, types of buyers. Um, a lot of this stuff is, is really cool to know, especially when it's industry-wide, but personalities are different. And I always find there's almost like three or four personalities that always stick up. There's a direct, somebody wants to come sell me, I'm a direct guy, you guys could tell, right? You gotta become a chameleon and be like, all right, now how do you sell to a person who's direct? Go be direct and be, you know, be on their wavelength. There's the analytical person, the thinker, sits behind their desk, wants to see all the stats, wants to see all the specs, wants to see everything. That's that person's, if that, that person's style, be a chameleon. Slow everything down. Come down to their pace. Don't try to rush things and push things over like as if you would do with a direct person like me. Be really slow. Be really calm. Get them the information they need. Be patient and, st and, and change yourself. There could be an influencer. Maybe it's going to be somebody who acts like they're the boss. <laughs> they act like they're going to be the ones who are going to sell you. And these people are the worst because they're going to fucking waste your time all the time. They're not the ones who can sign the check. But you may need their body because they're gonna go and help someone else, right? So these are like different personalities that I see come up all the time. It's up to you guys to become chameleons to understand how you can actually work with them. So if you, and I'll say, I can send this deck out to you guys after, but if you actually go and start filling all this stuff out on the types of people you, you met with, and if you don't know who they are, it's fine. The next couple of meetings you go to, fill all this out on the people you met, and you'll start to find, oh, this person's exactly like this. This person's just like this person over here. And you'll get like two or three or four different buyer persona groups going. And then you could actually start figuring out what your situation questions need to be better. How, like, how could you make your situation questions better for them? How could you make your problem questions better for them? Your implementation questions, your need payoff questions. And you could actually start using SPIN very effectively. And if you start actually learning about who these people are and be truly empathetic as to what's important to them, then you could actually change your style to be more effective and communicate better to them so that they, they would actually buy your product. It sounds super fucking easy to do, it's so hard. Um, I mess it up 
you know, all the time. But you, you stub your toe and you just keep learning, right? You're going to keep learning. You're going to fail fast. You're going to keep learning. But you got to start figuring this stuff out for anybody you're going to sell um, and how you're going to actually take them through the process to make it easy for them. Nobody wants to be sold, right? You walk into a store and you're not looking to buy anything. What's the first thing you, a salesperson comes up to you? I'm just browsing. Nobody wants to be sold. But there's, I bet you, in every, and in, 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 it's, it's fact, I mean, in every retail store, there's going to probably be the one or two people who are always at the top of the list. And there. Because they've mastered how they should go and approach people and make things really easy for them so it doesn't feel like a sale. Instead, it's actually a benefit on why they're actually purchasing what they're doing. So. All right, negotiation skills and tips. Uh, the beauty thing about spin selling is sales is not about you talking, right? I said like the feature advantage benefit thing is definitely when you're going to be speaking, but the only way you could get that right is definitely by your listening skills. You got to be very, very good at being able to listen to what, what your customers are saying. Your analytical skills, you know, on how you actually problem solve for them. I said before, ABC News calls me whenever there's anything wrong with their app, or they, and they call me whenever they think there's a problem. Why? Because I got the analytical skills to actually listen to them, be empathetic, put myself in their shoes, and be like, all right, Disney, here's what we could do to solve this problem. Let me, let me think about it and come back to you with what a solution could be. And so you, you actually have this analytical skill. Uh, be professional and control your emotions. This happens more often than not, not only at tribal scale, but from other salespeople I see, and this is where they, you know, an, another hurdle that you guys should be cognizant of. The second you find out that this person actually has, you're asking your situation questions, you're asking your problem questions, you're asking your impl implication questions, you're like, holy shit, this, my solution is going to solve all this stuff. You jump into everything, like boom, 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 like, oh my God, like, and you try to go do the sale. Be really smart and calm and control your emotions as you go through the sales process. Actually follow it to a T. Like I said earlier, it's like a playbook. Do A, B, C, D, E. Don't skip and try to rush it through. Don't skip and like try to make it to, to try to try to shove the sale down someone's throat because then they're gonna feel like they're getting sold. Then they're gonna realize that your intention is not their best intention. Your intention is to get that sale. You should make the intention that no, this isn't your best intention because this is a win-win situation. I'm actually doing you a favor because I'm actually solving your goddamn problems. Right? So be very, very Controlled in how, in how you do this. Um, be patient and respect the other side. I find, like, I go fast and I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm even getting worse as I go and I'm catching myself when I'm trying to slow down. But I go really fast and when someone's slow and like explaining themselves to me, I'm kind of like, all right, all right, let's get to the next point. Like, you know what, I, I want to just jump out and do that. And that fucking sucks for the other person because they, actually want to go through what their, what, what their actual problems are and needs. Um, so be very respectful of the other side and listen. Um, you know, use your problem solving skills and then persuasive skills. Um, it's another book and I recommend the audio book, but if you really want to start mastering some cool persuasive skills, and I love doing it through stories because the book tell, does stories, but have any of you listened to the 48, or, or read the 48 Laws of Power? So it's by Robert Greene, and what he does is he has 48 laws of what give, what give people power over somebody else. And he'll go into history and be like, Queen Victoria used this power, and here's how she used it. And this is why the law, this law of power is important. And it's an audio book, like, I listen to the audio book, and I still like, for 10 years now, I've just been like, you know, once a year, probably for 10 years, I just put it on again and I listen to it. Um, but it's pretty cool because it'll help you with your persuasive skills and understanding which law you should use when um, to get what you want. So there's a lot of ways to be persuasive. There could be the bullying method, but there's actually that book that lays out 48 methods for you on how to, how to do it really effectively. Any questions on that? All right, here we get into some more nitty gritty. So any, you guys all use a CRM? Which one are you on? You're in Fusionsoft? HubSpot. 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 You got a spreadsheet? Oh, okay. Nobody's on a spreadsheet, which is great. We are kind of. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Oh, um, so, 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 so. 
Yeah, um, so, look, when I started in sales, I was given a book, a pen, and a phone, and it was like, go, right? And I had to fucking write everything down. And I would write notes like, oh, Shane's going, Shane's going to Cleveland to go watch the Blue Jays. And, you know, I'd write all this other stuff down so that when I go meet Shane again, it's like, oh, yeah, this is what we talked about. Let's not miss a beat and build that rapport. There's fucking tools out there now that have made selling so fucking easy. Like HubSpot and Salesforce and Infusionsoft is all designed in a way that you have to be a complete fucking moron to not sell. It literally takes you step by step by step on how to go and do it. So I lose my goddamn mind when I go into a sales meeting and it's not fucking updated. I'm like, why aren't you just living in it? They literally programmed every step for you. So there's a couple key things you should do that are really good best practices. For every contact and for every lead you have, you have a follow-up. So if I have a call to make and I got a call, Laura, then I have that call with Laura, I put in my notes, and I have to have some sort of a follow-up. If I just had a call with Laura and I don't have any action item coming out of that call, then what the hell did I just do on that call? There's no point. Now, maybe Laura told me to go F myself, which is completely fine. What am I going to do? A simple follow-up of what am I going to do next? All right, well, Laura definitely needs to still get an email from me. Maybe I should invite her out to this conference we're going to be at, and I can see if I can get her time there, you know? And I'll start setting up follow-up tasks for Laura, even if she told me to ask myself. Most B2B sales happen. The first meeting happens after how many touch points? Eight. You're going to get told to go after yourself eight times before you get that first meeting. So when people give up after the first F off, they completely lost. I would have never gotten married if that happened. Right? Um, so it's eight touch points, but be creative with your touch points. So for every contact you have, create a follow-up action for that contact. Every single time. I have a call with them, follow-up. What's going to be my follow-up? The only time you don't have a follow-up with that contact is if that's the person you're not going to be selling to, and that, thing, that lead is completely dead. That's the only time you don't put a follow-up. Guess what that just did? You go, go through doing this for a month. The next month, do you know how easy your job becomes? You show up at your desk, you hit tasks in your, in your CRM, that shows you everything you need to do that day. So do that task list. You set yourself up to do that task list. You watch your deals move. So we do that all the time. Um, we keep calendar time for outbound. What's the best time to do outbound? <coughs> First thing in the morning, 8 o'clock. Why? People are walking in, they're talking about Donald Trump, they're like not worried about getting, getting their day started. Shit hasn't hit the fan in the meeting rooms, their calendar hasn't gone sideways yet. It's the first thing in the morning, they have nothing better to do. Cold call me. Do your outbound first thing in the morning. Now we also got awesome tools, right? Send later. Use report, use a boomerang or whatever you want to use in your email suite, so you can just start sending emails later. I queue up, still till today, probably 50, 60 emails that get sent out during the week on Sunday. Like, I'm sitting there watching baseball, and just be like, boom, I'm gonna queue up this email, queue up that email. People are thinking I'm up at 6.30 in the morning, I'm not. Well, I usually am, but. <laughs> I usually am, but yeah, I mean, I, so I queue them up. Why, because I know during the week I'm not gonna have, I'm, now I'm, well, I don't have time for it, right? So. Actually block off the time in your calendar for outbound. Um, construct and update the top 20 list we talked about already. And then utilize methods that generate more opportunities for you. So figure out what your prospecting looks like. I love list building and I love list building and I love list building at what time? End of the day, I go have dinner, I sit back down little skeleton in my closet as I like watching Big Brother and so I'll like put on Big Brother and I'll fucking list build during while I'm watching it. Why? Because that's not an eight time activity. I use my eight time to be in front of customers and do things that are actually going to drive revenue. And so I figure out my list building and my prospecting and I do all that the night before so that the next day I'm ready to go. All, all the work that I've done is, 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 is ready to go. Um, I'll walk you guys through how I use events and meal planning uh, in a bit. But some advice, I use Flipboard 
Go and follow the people who are being meaningful to you and read articles all the time. Um, you know, I'm always on my phone looking at articles when I'm on a commute or if I'm waiting in line for lunch or whatever, and I'm constantly reading and I'm understanding what's happening. One of the awesome, most awesome compliments I ever got, and it changed my way of thinking, I hope it changes your way of thinking too, was I was at the Washington Post and Wapo Labs is like their software development arm. And Wapo Labs at that time was doing, I don't know if you guys remember the Washington Post, were like the first ones on Facebook to actually start posting like news stories in the news feed. Right? They called it the Washington Post Social Connect. And if you were reading a story, I got to see, oh, you were reading that story too. And it was like the early days of Facebook. And I go in there and I'm like, hey, you guys are doing some innovative stuff. And I go and I do this presentation on media for them. And they look up at me and one of the guys goes, she like, can you come back every quarter? I'm like, you want me to come back and pitch you every quarter? And he's like, no, I just love the insight part of the presentation that you did. He goes, because I'm not afraid of the creative creativity that's happening in the group. I know you do amazing work. But a guy like you goes into 15 to 20 different media company rooms every month. The knowledge that you have is you actually come here and you could challenge us on what we're doing because you see where the market's going. Because I'm not afraid of us in this room. But having someone like you come in here reassures me what the hell's happening outside. And you got to become the expert and the thought leader of your domain. So in order to do that, read a lot and really start understanding not only the problems your customers are going through, but what's actually happening in the market and which way it's going. Right? And so you actually become the thought leader. I'm not afraid now, and I'm not even a technical person, but I'm not afraid now to sit in front of any CIO or any CTO and have a conversation and actually criticize what they're doing. And if there's a way to do that and a technique on how to do that, then it's not up here right now. Um, I don't suggest you guys go and start criticizing everybody you're selling to. But I could go do that because I become the master of my domain and I, I am the thought leader in that, in that, in that area. So <clears throat> people want to work with other people who are, who, who are thought leaders and actually appreciate that. Um, we verticalize. I mean, we can sell to anybody, right? So we verticalize, which, which really goes into the... The, the thought the thought level piece, uh, the thought leader piece um, and then research and analyze the market um, I put out white papers and I talk about what's happening in the market and I'm gonna have a magazine soon that I'm gonna send out I got a very active blog that's going on and I do all this because we're showing the thought leadership in the market so not only am I reading a lot and I'm researching a lot but I'm actually making an opinion and putting it out there and letting people criticize it and opening up my vulnerability to go do that. And there's a lot of cool things happen. Your clients will come to you and say, I disagree with you there. And you can have a real cool open debate about it. And the next thing you know, it's like, all right, well, let's start talking about the root problems of what we're actually talking about. How would you like to see them solved? And we actually could go solve those problems now. So um, start, start, start looking at it and start looking at your thought and leadership and the various mediums that you have to actually go and um, go out there. Now at Tribal Skills, we're about to start publishing white papers on FinTech, on retail tech, on this and that. And people are going to have to give me their information to download them, right? Um, HubSpot, actually, you don't even have to be uh, a licensed user of, has an amazing inbound marketing um, courses, courses on there that you can go learn all these techniques of how to actually drive inbound leads to you. That's the dream, right? When someone actually calls you to come work with you, that's like, wow. I love that. But they gotta be in the top 20 and they better follow in my 80 20 rule or else I don't want it. Um, all right, so here's how we schedule the day. And here's how we go and schedule the week. We do uh, 8.30 a.m. Sales, weekly sales meeting on Monday mornings. Why? I like doing it at eight. My co-founders don't really get up on time as, I, as much as I like. Um, but I like, I like doing it at eight. We do it at 8.30. Why? Go recap what you did last week. What are you guys going to be working on this week? Write blood on a wall in front of everybody. What you said you're going to close this week. I loved. I loved. Used to love doing it on chart paper, and then take that chart and stick it in the sales pit, and be like, "All right, this is what everybody said they're going to close that week," and have it right in their face all week. Because what's going to happen is the deals that don't close, and they got to go and see that again the next week. The team is looking at you like, "Come on." Why is that deal back up? You wrote in the blood that you're going to close. Happens the third week, now you really got egg on your face, right? So it creates a sense of urgency that all you got to know that week is that you better close these five deals you said you're going to go close. Um, so 
do the sales meeting, get everybody round up, hyped up, excited to go and start the week. Um, Friday at 3.30 p.m., why on Friday at 3.30 p.m.? It's really at that time, horrible time to cold call, horrible time to do meetings, horrible time to sell anything. I highly don't recommend you do anything on Friday afternoons except for going relationship building. And if you don't have a meeting with the client, pitch to your peers. You as a founder, go pitch to your engineer. Your engineer, get up, come pitch to you. Make everybody in your organization know how to talk and pitch your company. And go pitch to each other. You'll find a lot of cool stuff happens when you do that. I still till today when I watch somebody else pitch tribal scale end up picking up one or two or three things from what they're doing that I go and go, all right, that's going into my toolbox for the next time I'm in that situation. Because that was a cool way of how they explained it. But that's a cool way of how they showed that slide. But I've never seen a slide like that before. And we keep doing that over and over and over and over again. And guys, it's so much harder to pitch to somebody you know than somebody you don't know. Because you get up there, you get nervous. You're like, you know my business, you know, you know the pitch. So you'll catch me right away when you're screwing up. A customer won't have any idea, right? Um, so it's, it, it really starts refining the stories, and it's really good for everybody around the table to hear. Even if, like the person who's pitching, everybody's going to learn from that person. And the person, and not only are they going to learn, but the person who's actually pitching, you know, could be open for some cool constructive feedback after. Like, hey, you should have said this, you should have said that, and you guys are going to learn from each other's stories all around. So we do that, and then every Friday at our office. Um, Everybody has to get up and demo what they did that week. We have a ton of different projects on the way. I don't know if your organizations have to do this. Uh, but we get up and we demo every, everything that we did that week. I make the sales team sit in on that because they will actually learn the stories about what's actually happening, what accounts are doing, what the challenges were, so on and so forth. And those stories just become part of the personal when they're out with another client who may have the same problem. Um, Friday night, we get a weekly summary sent to BizDev at. Why do we do that? I shouldn't have to. I hate this one. But I do it. Because if everything was in fucking HubSpot, I wouldn't have to go do that. But I don't know why the reps think they're smarter than the CRM that was spent with millions of dollars of research behind it. And somehow they think that they're better than the CRM. So now I make them send me a weekly summary email of what they actually did that week. Accountability. It also lines them up for what they got to get done next week. Right, So it's a good way to recap, here's everything I did last week and let me build the momentum. We've all done this and we've all been there. How many times have you guys actually sat there being like, oh shit, that was a lead, it was, it's two weeks old now, fuck, I totally missed the drop the ball. Happens to all of us. You start doing stuff like this, you're not gonna do, that's not gonna happen. You're gonna, it forces you to go through your week and go, what did I do? Oh shit, here's four other things I gotta do. And so you'll, you'll, you'll actually get what you need done. Um, Sunday night, plan out what's ahead. Plan out the next week. Make sure it's all done. Weekly, have a breakfast and a dinner with a client. Everybody's got to eat. I love doing the breakfast. You go at 8 a.m., you have eggs, you shoot the shit. You learn so much if you do that all the time. Again, this is you putting money into your network. If you don't have a client who's going to go with you for breakfast or dinner, who do you take? You still got to go. I force them. I'm like, you got to go and find a mentor, you got to find somebody, you take Shane out, take someone from the DMZ out, go do something in the fucking industry and go talk to someone else outside of your network. Um, but, go, but go and do that every week. Um, we do a bi-weekly one-on-one with me or Dave, one of my founders, especially with new reps. And that bi-weekly is literally a venting session. Come sit with us and tell me how, what you're not getting, what are we not providing you. What else do you need? How can we help? So on and so forth. I've been a sales rep a lot of my career where I was like, like I said, I got a notebook and a pen and a phone, right? And then when, even when I got a computer, I never fucking had marketing teams. I had to build my own decks. I watch you doing this right now. And I'm like, it's, it's, it's fucking hard work because you've got to do everything. You've got to do your own content writing. you got to do your own deck. you got to create your pitch. you got to write the proposal. you got to do everything yourself. And you're still a founder of a company and you've got all this other stuff to do. And so it's really hard. But the cool thing in our bi-weekly is that when I hear reps start talking about what's actually bothering them, what's hindering them from selling, I go and unlock that stuff. I got people who write proposals now. I got people who can write decks. I got people who write blogs for them. I got literally a rep in our organization has the world just handed to them because I've been there and done all these various jobs by myself. And I wanted to build a scalable model 
so that I've got people who are responsible of all of this stuff. So that person has no excuse not to just go sell, sell, sell. And so every time we do that one-on-one, -on -one, I learn more and more and more on what happens. Um, every quarter, every, every, every quarter we do a sales retro. How do we do for that quarter? And then we do what we call a QBR, which is a quarterly business review. What are you going to do for the next quarter? What are you going to do with your top 20 accounts? How are you going to go get them? What strategies are you going to hit? What conferences do you need? What budget do you need? What's going to go up? What are you going to do to go out there and make that happen? I wanted to just go back to the dinner thing. Um, it works so, so, so well that I strategically host dinners based on industry vertical all over the world. So I'll go to New York City and I'll have a media dinner. And I'll have ABC News sitting with NBC News, sitting with Bloomberg, sitting with CBS, CBS sitting with, I don't know, I mean, name them, right? Like the, all the media companies. And I'll have all these people who don't know each other without the same job sitting there. And I'll have strategically two or three clients there also. And then I'll just get up and say, hey guys, this is not a sales pitch. I'm obviously in town and I want to talk to all of you about what your problems are and how I can help solve them, but this is not the time or place to do it. I really want to set this dinner up for all of you to get to know each other. And I start off the dinner one very simple way. I say, say your name, say what you do, and don't make it a sales pitch, keep it really quick, and say one interesting thing about yourself. And I always break the ice with something interesting about myself or I make fun of myself or whatever, right? If I break the ice, everybody laughs and off we go. The most craziest thing that I ever heard on the one interesting thing about yourself was in Vegas, a girl, <laughs> This girl gets up and she's like, the most interesting thing about me is that I've done an eight ball with bottle before. I was like, what? <laughs> and she's talking about cocaine and bottle at this like industry dinner. And it was the funniest thing. She broke the ice and everybody turned it into, okay, tell the most degenerate thing you've ever done in your life. Yeah. And like, it broke the ice so well around that table. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we do that. What did I, but when I do that, what did I just do? I put myself at the epicenter of what's important to all of these people. Why am I hosting this conference? I'm putting myself in the center, in tribal scale, in the center of this digital, the digital innovation conference. When you go and do that, it's amazing how little you'll have to sell. I've literally had NBC talking to ABC about their problems. And they were like, this is what she to solve it. You should go talk. And NBC calls me the next day and I get a fucking million dollar deal. I didn't even have to do anything. I just paid for dinner. And so it works really, really well. I highly recommend you guys curate your little, your networks and make, sure, make them small and tight and get them together. And once they start getting together, a lot of awesome things happen. I'm not the only one doing this. I got invited last night to go to dinner with Capital One and four of their VCs. They had some a couple of VCs here from Toronto and some from the Valley were in town. And they invited me and Derek Thug from Drop Loyalty to go, to, go, to go for dinner with them. And we're just like, what's the point of the dinner? Like, we got there and we're like, why just us two? And they were just like, we just, we like to take entrepreneurs out to dinner just to shoot the shit and build a relationship. She don't, I know you don't want investment right now. You may have a company tomorrow that you think is awesome that may need an investor like Capital One, and we want you to know we're here. That's it. That was their whole sales pitch. We got dinner and a great time. So, it, it's really effective, and again, it's you putting your coins in that piggy bank that's going to pay off for you later. All right, so the daily schedule. This is how you should structure your day. Don't veer off it. Honestly, this is the blueprint. Don't veer off it. If you do this, you will sell. You do your prospecting and outbound between 8 and 11. 11 and 1, you do any of your proposals, and you have to do scoping, so on and so forth. But you do any of your internal stuff. One to five, do customer-facing activities. Get in front of clients. You know, be pitching or asking. <laughs> no worries. Um, and then after 5 p.m., do all the stuff that doesn't matter. And prepare and go for, and like, and get your HubSpot or Infusion or whatever it is ready for the next day. I run a little bit differently. And the reason why I did so well at Extreme is my day started at 8. What time did I finish doing all my meetings and outbound? 8 p.m. Why? I was like, fuck this, the West Coast ain't sleeping. I'm gonna keep hustling and come closing them. And that's why I beat everybody else. I was mastering both coasts at the same time from here in Toronto. And I kept hustling. And then after 8 p.m., I would start doing this other stuff. Now, I do that on days that didn't have dinners and so on and so forth. But now look at me. 
I got an office in Dubai. I get up at four o'clock in the morning to go to get on calls. Guess what? My competitors ain't doing. They ain't doing that. I'm making money 24 hours a day. Just by utilizing my time and being more effective with it. So it doesn't matter what time zone you're in, but work to where your customers are and where your top 20 is going to take you. So here's a, this, this is something that we do at Travel Skill, and this is something that I think like individually sitting with you guys would be beneficial in like figuring out how to do. What we do is you get the lead, qualify it, bring them in for a tour, do your situation questions, problem questions, figure out what, they, what they're gonna need. Then we gotta do another qualification on it. are we actually gonna be able to have a solution for them. We then say, okay, maybe we gotta do some sort of upfront discovery type work and so you get a proposal, we execute on that discovery, and then we go into scoping out what a larger project would be. We start talking about pricing, you get another proposal, you negotiate on it, paperwork, and then you either won or you lost, right? Like that's the way we work at Travel Skill. This changes depending on the organization. Um, so you gotta find out what the right mix is gonna be. Here's some key things though. Everybody, and this, it's hard to show this, but everybody looks at this as sequential. You gotta start doing this shit in parallel. Why would you go give a client an NDA? Give a client an NDA before a proposal, why? Not because you care that they're gonna go and share your information everywhere else. You wanna find out how hard it is to work with their legal department to get something signed. You're gonna start learning who those people are in the other, other departments to actually go and get something signed. Start your paperwork earlier. How long does your legal take? Let them get our sample MSA or SOW in front of you so you can start looking at that. And this will start closing your sales cycles smaller. You know, working with the big banks, sometimes it can take six months, eight months, a year to get this paperwork done. Start figuring out how you can start getting into their, into their um, system even earlier. Close one, take everybody who worked on the deal, just not the salesperson, Take everybody who worked on the deal, and the reason I say everybody is because there's going to be engineers, there's going to be a product person, marketing person, everybody who worked on the deal, and celebrate like crazy. And let everyone know this was a team win. It's never just the one person going out and getting that win. If you lost at any given stage, do something really simple. And what we call it, it's our retro, and we go like this. You literally, what went well? What are we confused about? What sucks? And we'll go do a retro and everybody will just write up here and no feelings get hurt, write everything that's possible up there. And from there we'll make action items so that the next deal will have no sad faces or confused faces. Hopefully they all just become happy faces. And we do that every time. It's really lightweight, it only takes like half an hour. You get awesome action items out of it and you'll really have a cool post-mortem on how you go. Now there's textbooks out there on how to do an effective post-mortem and like deep dive into why you lost, you know why you lost. Keep it lightweight, figure out how you're gonna get better for the next time and just move forward. You'll, and also, when you lost, you probably never lost. I'll give you a quick story here. Um, there's a large healthcare insurance provider here, came to me, uh, I came to that, I, I signed up with them to have our benefits at Travel Skill done through them. Um, and I realized, like, I went and bought a pair of eyeglasses, and I was like, I want a fucking mobile app to, like, upload my receipts. Like, what kind of bullshit is this? So I write to the CEO, and I'm like, hey, I, I, oh, this is what we do. Let me help you out. And he's like, hey, actually, funny enough, we are about to do this. Introduces me to his CTO. I go and meet with the CTO. Everything's going amazing. And he's like, you know, I'm at the 11th hour with, him, with one of your competitors. I'm about to sign the deal. And so, like, in one week, I steamroll this process. I'm just like, let's go. I go right through it, give him the proposal, everything. He's like, but chill, I've kind of given them my word. I've given them my word. And I was like, look, I get it. I could already tell, I had the deal lost. I wasn't gonna fucking win. He wasn't, he didn't, he didn't have the balls to go and be like, you guys are out. I'm going with, and we're a young, small company. Like he's gonna go to his boss and be like, all right, um, I never, like, I'm not going to this small company. This is a big company, I'm not gonna get fired, whatever, whatever. I go, okay, cool. I go to him like this, I go, look, you're gonna go with someone else. Here's what happens in the industry. I'm not saying this vendor's gonna do this to you, but here's what happens in the industry. You're gonna go in, your timelines won't get met, you won't get your deliverables on time, they're not gonna follow an agile process, you're gonna get frustrated, and then they're gonna come back to you and they're gonna say the price that you just spent with us 
is 80% gone, we need another SOW, we need more money from you. And he goes, why are you wishing that upon me? And I'm like, I'm not, this is what happens in the industry. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna step up to the plate, I'm gonna take your shitty 30% of your budget that you have left, I'm gonna save your ass and make sure you don't get fired after that vendor just messed with you. But guess what? You saw my rate card, and ever, ever, ever from that day onwards, that rate card that I've shown you is gonna be our rate card. Three months later, he walked into my office and was like, this is your I told you so fucking moment. I got the deal. I took a beating on the first deal. So that's okay too, you could take a loss when you know the client's gonna be there. But is he ever gonna negotiate with me on rates ever again? Never. Who's he gonna trust always? Me. I took a shit kicking to get him out of a mess. And I warned him that this is what happens. So when a deal is lost, it's never lost. It's never ever lost. You gotta figure out how you could actually turn it, turn it around. Also find opportunities when your customers are pissed off. That's, the, that's another big thing that a lot of people mess up. When your customers are upset, find out why would they're upset, what the root causes, chances are there's upsell opportunities there. Cool. Um, we kind of got gone through this. I don't want to go through all this other stuff with you. I think I can just send it to you. We got templates and stuff in here. Um, you can share the deck with us. Yeah, I'll share the deck. I think it's an asset, you know, any copy you want that. Mm -hmm. I got a couple videos here too that will make you laugh. But uh, one of them is Boiler Room, right? Uh, one Boiler Room, yeah. So that, by the way, is one, probably one of my favorite sales movies ever. Yeah.